Good morning, everyone. Welcome to day two of the 2022 Cal OER Conference. My name is Shelley Winance, and I'm one of the California State University representatives on the Cal OER Organizing Committee. Before we jump into our opening session this morning, I'd like to recognize and thank our sponsors. Let me do that. A huge thank you goes out to all five of our generous sponsors for supporting this conference. This morning's session is focused on OER in our local context, our California higher education systems. I'm very excited to hear from each of our system representatives. So let's get started with just a quick introduction from each of our system representatives that we have here this morning. So I'll, Rebecca, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Good morning, everyone. Rebecca Ron O'Shaughnessy. I'm the Vice Chancellor for uh, Educational Services and Support at the California Community College's Chancellor's Office. Great. Welcome. Leslie? Hello, everybody. The, um, I am the Assistant Vice Chancellor of Academic Technology Services in the Chancellor's Office located in Long Beach, the Cal State Chancellor's Office in Long Beach. And my area covers affordable learning solutions, which is what we'll talk about today, um, but many other academic technologies in addition to, for example, I should say for um, of the LMS initiative, libraries for the CSU, um, all the online teaching and training, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm looking forward to spending time with you all. Thank you. And Delmar? My name is Delmar Larson. I'm a professor of chemistry at the University of California, Davis. I'm also the director of the LibreText Project. I don't formally represent the University of California, uh, nor uh, UC Davis in my uh, words, just to make sure it's clarified that I am uh, not formal in my overview of things here. Thank you very much. Thank you all for your introductions. We've asked each of our speakers from the three systems to discuss what's happening in their respective systems related to OER and everything open. After all three have spoken, we'll accept questions for our speakers using the Pathable chat. You can find the Pathable chat located on the same page where you join the session. I also recommend using theater mode for the best experience. So let's get started and begin with an update for the California Community College system. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm just waiting for the slide to pull up on my end. Got it. Um, well, good morning, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today with you to provide you with a system update. Um, before I begin, I think it's really important to kind of highlight the uniqueness of our governance structure within our system. So next slide, please. Um, we currently serve 1.8 million students every year, and we do so through our 116 colleges across the state, organized into 73 districts with locally elected board of trustees. So the chancellor's office here, the community colleges at the state level is governed by a board of governors. And to the maximum degree permissible, we are directed to maintain and continue local autonomy and control in the administration of community colleges. So in short, that just means that at a system level, we focus on creating statewide enabling conditions, such as strategic frameworks, policy and regulations, funding, field guidance and, techno uh, and technical assistance, et cetera, to really support the local implementation of practices that advance student success. So there's a lot of local planning and decision-making that are taking place as a, a matter of uh, practice in our system. Next slide, please. Uh, quickly, vision for success for our system. Uh, that is our collective North Star. The vision goals are all about improving student outcomes. And it's important to highlight that the vision very much focuses on equitable success and closing achievement gaps, both from a population perspective and from a regional perspective. Next slide, please. And Guided Pathways is the vehicle for us to really ground our work towards equitable success for our students and the vision for success goals. Fundamentally, it allows us to really interrogate our existing structures and practice and dismantle inequitable uh, structures 
and to be laser focused on student experience and removing student friction points. And uh, different from uh, my fellow higher ed partners, you know, our former Chancellor Oakley uh, says that, you know, we are proudly serving the top 100% students. So we are an open access institution. So really for us, equity means how do we really serve our students, all of our students uh, through system reforms, as well as high touch interventions. Next slide, please. And I want to kind of spend a few minutes on this slide, really focusing on the student friction points around accessing necessary instructional materials. First, I think it's important to acknowledge that instructional materials are necessary for successful student engagement and completion. So student success necessitates that we treat students equitable access to these materials as a must have, not a nice have, right? Because of this, because this directly impacts student outcome and the vision for success goals, therefore it's our bread and butter. So as we as a system needs to tackle this issue with or without dedicated funding. Now, when we think from a student's perspective, particularly those who lack financial resources, they are already starting from a deficit, right? So it's textbook purchase time. They have no money to pay for textbooks. So they now they need to hustle, right? They need to find alternative sources. They work more. They might skip meals. The financial load they have to shoulder is obvious. And if fortunately they are eligible to uh, receive textbook support programs on campus, there's still additional time and effort. Think transportation, childcare, time away from work, right, to navigate these programs. And then on the administrative side, paperwork, 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 we all know that if you want to apply for anything, right? On top of that, they need to also then attend appointments and meetings throughout the term to establish and maintain program eligibility to make sure that they continue to receive this type of support. Or they need to search high and low for low-cost textbook options, right? Uh, if they are fortunate enough to have an OER class, fabulous. Uh, but otherwise, they're looking for third party resellers, libraries, fellow students, right, to purchase used books or borrow books during the class. And then on top of that, psychologically, there's anxiety related to time constraints and deadlines, and shame and self blame for needing additional help to start with. And really also, uh, potential depression relating to falling behind coursework due to lack of instructional materials. And it's not too, it's not hard to see, right? These uh, compounding friction points uh, can make or break a student's experience with our institutions and with higher education altogether. And those friction points are uh, disproportionately, uh, disproportionately felt by students without adequate access to financial resources, right? So when we see this system, when we see our system, really as it's set up right now, it's designed to really just serve some students better than others and penalize the poor. We know there's a structural issue that we have to address and requires a comprehensive solution set. Next slide, please. And I wanna introduce you to our social determinants of educational success framework. We really rely on this framework at the system level to align advance our strategic efforts, to shift our paradigm from just individual programs and pilots to how that fits into a student-centered support ecosystem. So financial stability, health, and mental well-being and support networks are the three core social determinants because we see these three factors contribute to most of our student support needs and largely within our sphere of influence and control. And we wanna prioritize our energy, right, in these areas. And at the center of this ecosystem is burden shifting. So it's not just about helping students navigate through the burdens, and find workarounds, but it's about shifting burdens away from students to institutions. So, right when we have ambassadors, program staff, counselors, and others to help individuals navigating, that is still just increasing access for some, right? It's not really structural changes. So what we are also looking at is how do we expand and maximize that impact, right? And when we shift and eliminate burdens, we have, this, we have to dismantle structures. And student access to necessary instructional materials is one of those structure changes that we need to be making. And most, uh, and the most recent ZTC investment presents a great opportunity for us to do, to do that. Excuse me. Next slide, please. Just to dive in a little bit deeper, connecting kind of access to instructional materials to our core social determinant of financial stability. In short, it really means 
the sentiment, right? Financial stability means the sentiment of like, I can go to college and I can afford college. Students then don't have to worry because college is affordable and students know that they will have sufficient fund to pay for it. And the side this is trying to illustrate the balance that we need to get to for our students. Uh, for them to be su successfully enrolled, persist, and complete in our institutions. And this obviously is just an illustration. Uh, there's there really too, ma too much to list on both sides. So um, on the left is really cost of success. So it's much, much more than tuition and fees, right? Um, it's really all the costs that students realistically need to really be able to afford, uh, to really uh, uh, give up what they are doing, right? Their jobs and other obligations and to attend colleges. And on the right side, all the support students may receive from federal, state, and institutions. And in general, the boxes on the right side are more individualized support, and that serves only some students, right? Because of eligibility requirements and other administrative processes, they're baked in, right? And the boxes on the left side are more structural and intend to benefit everyone with low or no burdens. In the case of cost for instructional materials, the prevailing strategies currently have largely been on the right side, right? So for example, many of our categorical programs provide book grants for eligible students. So in addition to the administrative and psychological loads associated with receiving support, we're also seeing uncoordinated duplication of services provided. And we hope through this investment and OER being a key strategy in that, right? We hope to leverage this uh, to shift our support from the right side to the left side, then it meaningfully reduce the cost of success for all of our students. Next slide, please. So for the rest of my presentation, I wanna focus on sharing with you how we are envisioning to leverage the ZTC appropriation and this momentum around this effort, right? To address system inequities that I mentioned above and make sure that all the investments will benefit students in tangible ways in the end. Next slide. Um, quick background on our legislative language that provided this one-time investment, $150 million for low and no zero cost textbook degrees and our certificate programs. And OER is explicitly mentioned as a strategy. All of that is in service of the legislative intent. Right, which is to reduce the overall cost of education and decrease time to completion. And I will add on top of that, right, impact on our students. So financial, administrative, and psychological loads that I mentioned earlier. Next slide, please. Quick reminder, like, well, if we just take a look back, that our system did receive a one-time funding six years ago. And that was $5 million over a three-year time frame. And this slide just shows some of the uh, highlights through the grant reporting. A third of our colleges participated in the planning and implementation efforts. 37 programs, uh, ZTC programs and 404 ZTC courses uh, were developed and 31,000 students were able to benefit from at least one ZTC course. And we also have uh, the sample of the subject areas on the right. Next slide, please. And the insight we gained from this last time around um, has to inform our program design this time around, right? It's about continuous improvement at the end of the day. The biggest finding that we uh, pointed out in our legislative report was that there was insufficient uh, data last time around to truly connect our output, which are the programs and courses we developed to the intended outcomes, which are students whether or not students as a whole have paid low or zero cost for their instructional materials to complete their degree programs. And a big part of that was just because a three year time period just isn't long enough to give us that longitudinal data to really track students. So, and we only had one end of a grant report uh, to really collect uh, all the information that, that, uh, that we collected so far. And the second piece of it, the impact of lack of data is really on the sustainability of the uh, initial round of OER efforts, right? So in fact, the current data on DTC OER offering was compiled by our dedicated AS Academic Senate uh, partners manually reviewing college course schedules and search for the college unique DTC sim uh, symbols. So I wanna give a, a huge kudos to Michelle and her team for their dedication on this effort um, but that's a problem, right? We need to have a system 
when we develop something, we need to be able to retain that information and have the data available so we can actually leverage the data and leverage the resources more broadly. And the legislative report also provided additional recommendations for uh, including, so for example, how do we make sure, right, the, the ZTC programs and courses are truly zero cost? Um, and then what are the hidden costs? And are there ways to eliminate those uh, hidden costs, right? So a big part of that is what does zero cost mean? And for us, fundamentally, it's about how much out-of-pocket cost students have to incur by enrolling in these ZTC programs and courses. And the second piece of it is, as we continue to think about quality and equity in our teaching and learning agenda, how do we make sure our exist existing OER ZTC, ZTC OER programs and courses are incorporating culturally relevant content and also going through a rigorous, right, the same type of rigorous uh, equity and quality check and then continue to improve as, as time goes by and we continue to learn and evolve. And then also about sharing and adopting, how do we share and adopt existing quality DCC programs and courses materials within our same community college district? So we're leveraging resources and maximizing benefits. Um, and then also, how do we think about general education requirements since those are the things that students will all have to take, right? So how do we, can we, can we continue to uh, prioritize and focus on development and curation of the ZTC OER materials for these courses? And a critical part when we think about the legislative intent around time to completion, pathway, clarifying pathways is critical. So how do we really work on uh, the program sequencing, right? And, and clarify path to completion. And then really also think about our capacity in the, um, in the, on, the equitable, uh, on the equitable access front, right? We have our California Virtual Academy, uh, a virtual campus course exchange, which really allows uh, students to cross enroll in different institutions. So how do we make sure that these ZTC uh, courses are available on these platforms so students can cross enroll if they are unable to enroll in their own institutions for uh, ZTC courses? Next slide, please. So that was really the retrospective. So fast forward to today. And when we think about what do we need to go uh, moving forward, we wanna be very explicit uh, with what this is all about and where we're trying to go. Our ZTC strategy as a whole has to, at the end of the day, alleviate the student friction points and advance vision for success. OER is a key strategy of ZTC, so it also needs to be explicitly advance this, these goals, right? So to us, it's not just about how to develop OER in general and how to develop as many OER as possible, but it's also about how we as a system ensure a robust infrastructure so we can support the development, curation, adoption, and, and improvement of OER as a whole. So it has to be a continuous process and we have to build that enabling condition to support that. Next slide, please. And with that, we are taking a multi-pronged approach uh, to this ZTC strategy. So that includes a data infrastructure build out really kind of speaks to the, to, the, to the lessons learned we have from last time around. And then we also wanna uh, really focus on strategic uh, task force design. So we, uh, we are launching a cross-functional task force to really inform, further inform our ZTC, OER, ZTC and OER strategies. And then last bit is when we look at our grant funding, how do we intentionally uh, take a, a, a careful, uh, and, and um, well-informed ap uh, uh, approach to the funding and to intentional program implementation. And that's why we are uh, approaching it with a phased uh, 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 funding allocation model. Uh, next slide, please. So this is, uh, this is a, uh, just a snapshot of our new data element that we just launched in May uh, with a close partnership with our Academic Senate. So this data element now is added into our management information system, really as an initial infrastructure building step to collect system level data on instructional material costs. So this one is really a base, uh, is really a baseline data. Um, as part of the data submission, each term colleges will have to report on how they make their instru instructional materials for each course section available to students, uh, you know, low cost or no cost. So the new data from these submissions will help us 
uh, bring community colleges closer to understand as a system the various strategies they're already in place that institutions are utilizing to make course selections low or low cost. So, and it's more to come, right? This is really the first step towards building that infrastructure. So we're really thinking about what are the key questions we need to be asking uh, the colleges, also understanding without putting too much burdens on our institutions, but really understand the strategies they're currently in place and the concerns uh, that, that, that needs to be surfaced. And then really some of those uh, system level support that we can provide, again, go back to the, uh, the, the, the enabling conditions building, uh, we as a chancellor's office, system office, um, the, the role that it's a key role that we have to play in. Next slide, please. And we are also assembling a, a, a cross-functional task, task force to really focus on, uh, on ZTC strategies. Um, and, and these are the, the four boxes with arrows are really kind of the four goals of the task force, right? As you can see, you know, um, people we have learned over and over again, people don't do optional. So what does that look like for us to have recommendations to really think about policies and regulations that can really strengthen our students' equitable access to required uh, instructional materials? And when we think about, um, you know, system resources, this is a one-time resource, which is fabulous and historic, but this is, a, you know, ZTC is going to be, needs to be a, a long-term effort because it touches on, uh, again, an important structure, structure of accessing necessary instructional materials, right? So what does that look like for us to be able to maximize our existing uh, system resources to support that? And then here as a very explicit goal, right? How do we establish a robust and sustained OER resource support infrastructure? And then last bit of it is also, how do we really make sure that colleges are prioritizing uh, ZTC as, as an effort because they're really seeing our student experience is really being, uh, is, is really being um, hurt by the tremendous uh, loads that students have to shoulder uh, due to their lack of critical uh, instructional materials. Um, and then it's really important to, to kind of mention that this is a, we really envision this to be cross-functional because this really touches many uh, uh, system partners. So we definitely anticipate to have a strong student presence there and then also strong faculty presence from our academic senate partners and our OER reps. And then we think about our leadership, the CEOs and CBOs and our instructional officers, our student services officers will all need to be involved the libraries. So all of these partners that have a role in college affordability, especially around instructional materials, uh, will have a role because it will impact all of their work and also impact the people they have in their current programs. They're serving these roles, right? Remember, we're shifting our support from the, really the right side, which are the high touch individual supports to a more of a system level support. The roles will have to shift. And what does that look like? We need everyone's uh, really recommendation and their experience to really inform that, uh, inform that overall strategy. Next slide, please. So this is really kind of a description of overview of our ZTC grant program, really, right? So we are providing ZTC grants in multiple funding phases. Funding phase one uh, is really $20,000 uh, $20, uh, to every college, um, really asking uh, colleges to, um, to really plan and uh, to, to plan for the development of a ZTC program. The first time around, it was, more, it was more optional, kind of saying whoever wants to pilot a ZTC program, please apply. And to us now, the planning grant is really for everybody because this is not just a program, but this touches on student friction points and their access to critical materials for success, right? So that is why we want colleges to really engage in the planning process. So it's not a whether or not anymore. It's are you ready now for further support or do you need additional support to then engage in the work, right? It's more of a when question. So then that comes into phase two, uh, districts and colleges will apply for funding through a competitive process to then develop and implement ZTC programs locally. Again, it's competitive from the fact from the, the, the perspective of uh, how many colleges are ready to implement and how many colleges will need additional support so we can input so then they can implement later. 
And then future funding phases will be really informed by the analysis of the task force and recommendations. And then also the finding from the first two phases of the grants. So then we can make a better uh, informed decision in terms of a future uh, 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 grant uh, allocation. And then also I wanna, you know, and then so the, um, the line around um, actually the two things. So one is really the top yellow arrow, right? Data collection and refinement has to be in place for us to really evaluate impact. And it has to be long enough for us to be able to see the outcome because these are fundamentally degree programs. And then also I wanna mention the ZTC task force is really a time limited task force because it has a clear charter and clear goals and it will sunset when the recommendations are done and then there will be additional implementation right, uh, potential implementation, uh, participatory governance structure in place to make sure that we're implementing these strategies with fidelity. Next slide, next slide, please. And this is really the end, but really what I'm hoping to really convey uh, to all the partners and all the audience today is this is something that we're very excited to take on and we are very grateful for the investment, but we wanna really use this investment, not just as a grant, as a program, but as a ZTC strategy to really tackle financial stability as a core social determinant to advance the success of our students. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. We'll turn things over to Leslie Kennedy for an update from the CSU system. Okay, well, thank you. It was a great overview, Rebecca, and um, I learned a lot and uh, appreciated that information. So our two systems work very closely together. 50% of our students uh, tr that uh, transfer in come from the California Community Colleges, and we share lots of resources and then also um, legislation around grad, uh, transfer initiatives, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So um, that's one of the beauties of what we do with the C within the CSU and how we partner with the uh, community colleges, the community colleges and the system. So my overview today is the CSU and uh, Affordable Learning Solutions Initiative, and I'm showing you our website. And, uh, but just to give you a quick overview uh, of the CSU, uh, we are really quickly, where's the um, focused on the graduation initiative 2025. That is our main mission at the moment. And it's about uh, assisting our students to retention and to graduation in a timely fashion. And we've been doing this since 2018, I believe, uh, maybe even earlier than that. And uh, uh, every year we've had milestones or benchmarks and we've met those. And so uh, it's been a large pro program within the CSU to create different resources for our students towards their success in graduating. That means student services and uh, uh, software products, digital divide discussions, um, and uh, basic needs in, uh, programs, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's been a very positive experience and it continues to move forward towards 2025. The, the COVID impact uh, did not necessarily affect it negatively. In fact, we continue to increase the graduation rates through that process as well. Uh, we also have a very strong focus in the graduation initiative to increase or decrease, I should say, decrease our achievement gap or our equity gap, as we call it. And so that's also a big focus. And, and that's where OER can also support all of our students in so many ways because of uh, potential basic needs, challenges they may have, and or um, being able just to navigate resources um, that they are more likely to be able to access because they're digital. So quick overview of the CSU, probably most of you know, um, many of you might've gone to a CSU, we're 23 campuses from Humboldt to San Diego. We have over half a million students, um, 80% are undergraduates, so we're not an undergraduate uh, university system like uh, what Del Mar's UCs are all about. Um, we have over 28,000 faculty, and then we confer over 100,000 degrees every year. Um, so that's a, you know, we have central, the state, uh, northern, and then concentrated in the, in the major city areas as well. 
Um, what I wanted to point out is over the last few years, we've been spending time with legislative initiatives and funding from the state, working with the community colleges to address textbook affordability. And it's been a great experience to support and get to know so many of the community colleges colleges and the UCs through that process. So we had created this little map of all the various campuses that had been participating in, um, in the uh, Cool for Ed program. You've probably heard of Cool for Ed and some of the other activities as well. So um, where does the CSU come from here? Well, uh, obviously you were, you know, teaching comprehension, in, com comprehension or comprehensive institution. But one of the areas that the uh, reason why CSU is so active with OER is uh, the Merlot initiative. Merlot.org was established um, quite a few years ago, over 20 years ago. And it's probably the largest referatory of open educational resources in the world. And you can see by this, um, this website how many learning resources are in are, are cataloged in Merlot and then also the registered members. You don't one doesn't have to register, but it's always um, uh, advantageous to have those registered members. But we see a lot of people have accessed um, Merlot over the years without re um, registering. So it's not a, a complete picture of that. But Merlot was established within the CSU. It's been a, a great starting point for many years. And uh, so that's how we got started in, in getting involved with um, supporting our students with zero cost course materials. Then um, through legislation, and I won't give you the numbers because it's, that's not fun, um, but just letting you know that the California Open Online Library was developed out of several initiatives, which was a, a cross between a cross um, collaboration between the CSU, the UC, and the community colleges, and I was part of that um, starting in 2014. And then through some additional funding that we got from the state, we also extended it through Assembly Bill 798 so many numbers. And then we've established this California Open Online Library. Many of you all are probably using this by clicking on the course materials showcase. And what we've tried to do is to associate, um, let's say, courses with the CID numbers that have been part of a collaboration between the community colleges and the CSU. So let's say you select one of these courses, then um, then it's affiliated with that CID, which is the learning outcomes that have been agreed upon for those transfer GE level courses between our systems. So California Open Online Library, we through these various initiatives have been able to collect what campuses are using it. Right now we can see this OpenStax book is being used by 21 of our universities within our system and 69 community colleges. The intent, and if one clicks on it, one can see which campuses are involved. But the intention there was to help faculty realize that this open educational resource is actually been vetted and being utilized by um, campuses throughout our systems throughout the state. We also had done some evaluations uh, uh, or, or um, uh, facilitate some evaluations with some faculty over the years. And then we also connected in, the, in here the Merlot ratings as well. So if an instructor comes into the Cool for Edge showcase and they're teaching a certain discipline, they might find OER based on their um, discipline. And uh, this could be very helpful. And that was the intention of the Cool for Ed um, project. So back to affordable learning, what is affordable learning solutions in the CSU? It's really about helping faculty be successful in regards to finding resources that are zero cost um, library resources that are paid for by the CSU, but are zero cost for the students and or low cost materials. But um, as, as I mentioned around the open educational resources, we've got Merlot that we uh, uh, focus on, Cool for Ed as well. And then we also uh, promote Libre Texts um, because that allows faculty to uh, select other OER that's been um, developed and then create their own resources or their own textbook for their course. So, um, so we don't, we have not been funded and we have uh, uh, mostly encouraged in our affordable learning solutions initiative faculty to 
uh, find the OER, locate OER through stipend support and workshops, et cetera, and these resources, and then uh, consider adopting them for their instructional environment. So we haven't been developing OER as much as the community colleges have. We haven't been funded to do that. Um, the system, Cal State Chancellor's Office system, funds the campuses and has been for years uh, the Affordable Learning Solutions Initiative. And so you can see across uh, the cross section of campuses who are participating. Um, every campus selects a, a, a coordinator. They have to create a website that is a ALS website. They, um, if they have faculty showcases, we highlight them. Uh, we also require part of the. Uh, and each one of these campuses can apply for funding from a small pot of money that the CSU provides. And um, and so then it's required to include uh, uh, the library as much as possible as a stakeholder, the bookstores as a stakeholder, um, ac faculty and students, um, st um, student affairs and other areas as well. So you can see them represented in different ways at the different campuses here. Um, some of our campuses, the student governments have gone ahead and passed resolutions. We've got faculty resolutions. All of that was happening quite a bit when we had those that funding from the state a few years ago. And so those remain there and uh, are shared with the student government associations across the system as well. So that gives you a sense of the activities and every campus, if they apply for funding, they have to uh, designate a coordinator and then this uh, uh, a committee of those stakeholders that I mentioned a minute ago. And then they propose what they're going to do with the funding that uh, between 15 to 20,000 that they can apply for every year um, with regards to faculty awareness, to helping with faculty adoption and um, so that program has been in play since uh, 2012. Uh, I came on board in 14, so I can um, attest for everything that happened from 2014 on. So um, on our site, you'll see different resources, but um, what I wanted to point out was uh, we tried to track our savings from our, uh, potential savings with our students um, and, and with this, o this ALS initiative in the CSU. And um, so we're cur currently collecting the 21, 22 uh, information, uh, but you can see the amount of savings that have um, been accumulating over the last few years. I see that 2021 is at the bottom here and it needs to be put to the top. But anyway, we're up about to about 75 million potential savings for our students so far. And that's a combination of the OER or those types of activities within the CSU and then also the bookstore activities because they are running those immediate access initiatives and um, some of them are also promoting as much as possible the OER initiatives as well. So um, that is a, and the reason why I say it's potential is because um, we rely on the campuses to provide these reports and uh, and it's very difficult to do for our coordinators, um, especially since some of the campuses are very large. You know, Cal State Northridge is up to 40,000 students and uh, all the way down to our Maritime Academy, which has about 1,000 students. So the amount of work for reporting is challenging, but we that's, but we get a good sense every year of what's happening within the campuses. And, and so we feel comfortable sharing that with you and sharing it on our site. The other um, piece of information that I'd like to focus on is Senate Bill 1359 required us to mark our courses. That means the community colleges and the CSU to mark our zero cost course materials in our um, student information systems or student schedules so that when a student is scheduling a class and looking at courses, um, they would then be able to identify the zero the courses that might have zero costs. So uh, that's something that we've been promoting and we continue to work with the campuses to refine that process amongst them. Currently, the numbers that I have seen based on what we've been able to extricate from our student information system because the courses are marked zero cost uh, is a, a, in the last semester we got data. Um, it was about 150,000 uh, students were impacted by the zero cost course materials options. Now we teach about 89,000 sections a semester through across all the systems. So 
And with a half a million students, you would say you could say it's about a quarter of the students are potentially being impacted currently by um, zero cost course materials that the faculty have adopted and have implemented in their courses. So we did a lot of work at the beginning to help faculty and the campuses understand what that was about. We've recently added to our website a kind of an eligibility suggestion because we sometimes saw that um, a course might have been uh, marked as zero cost course material, but um, there might have been a required purchase of a of a calculator or or some other type of items, ancillary item. And so we we feel that does not make a course zero cost. So we've recently added this designation on our site to kind of help the faculty, the campuses see what it looks like. And what we've got here is an example of a course schedule at Long Beach State where a course is designated with an icon that we worked with, uh, collaborated with, with the um, community colleges, with James Glapad Grossbach. Um, helped that. You all, someone in your side designed that and then we've adopted it as well. So we work together on this process and we continue, as I said, to refine it as well. So um, that's a quick overview of what's happening in the CSU. We post on our site also the, the faculty, the librarians, the um, directors of instructional technology, the instructional designers, uh, who are and the faculty developers who are the designated coordinators and these are volunteers in our system again so that's another challenge for our folks uh, but we do have a lot of library involvement which is uh, very much appreciated and then we also have faculty development centers our professional development groups who have stepped up to assist so every campus um, has a uh, um, a designated person based on who volunteers, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a very much a grassroots initiative in the CSU. Um, we're, uh, we're, we're very excited that a lot of the data we're seeing and that we saw yesterday in the, when the, the um, uh, presentations that um, the awareness for faculty has grown significantly over the years, especially since I started doing this in 14. And uh, we're hoping that we continue to grow and support the adoption of zero cost course materials as you are doing as well. So um, we're going to hopefully benefit from the multiple uh, zero costs um, materials that the community colleges are creating. Uh, for example, the ethnic studies primer that was just created recently. And uh, we're, we are promoting that um, significantly because we share that requirement to be teaching ethnic studies courses between the community colleges and the CSU. And that should help um, in addition to the ethnic study library databases that we've purchased um, to help offset costs for those courses as well. So it's a, always a moving uh, experience, um, expanding, changing, um, and it's dynamic. And, it, and we're really uh, pleased to be able to work together with Michelle Pilati, the AS, ASSCS, I think I dropped an S there, um, and then also with um, the UC represented by Del Mar. We meet regularly. We used to meet face-to-face -face in the community college chancellor's office, but now we continue on and meet uh, online and we share uh, our our um, goals and our resources and uh, and try to um, continue to uh, focus on our student success, which is the ultimate goal. And um, it's very it's a very positive experience for us. So I think um, that would wrap up what I wanted to share uh, today and. Um, I'll be happy to take questions later on, uh, but I'll turn it back over to you, Shelly. Shelly is one of our, I'll just call you out, Shelly, one of our um, AL Affordable Learning Solutions Coordinators at Fullerton College, uh, State, Fullerton State, or Cal State Fullerton, sorry. Thank you, Leslie, for that fabulous update. And Del Mar, I'll turn it over to you to talk about the UC.
Okay, now you guys can hear me, right? Okay, sorry about that. I didn't know that was on. Can people see the, my screen? Okay, now I will begin. <clears throat> um, so, uh, again, my name is Delmar Larson, professor of chemistry at the University of California, Davis. I've been involved in OER for close to 15 years now. Um, most people know me uh, 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 within the OER community as the director of the founder of the LibreText project, but I'm not going to be wearing that hat uh, for most of this presentation. And, and the goal of this uh, discussion is to give the state of affairs uh, in regarding OER uh, in the University of California system. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so I don't want to go into too much detail, actually not much at all, about what OER is and the benefits uh, thereof because it's discussed multiple times already in this proposal. I just want to just uh, give a, a few numbers that's associated with the University of California, uh, which is essentially uh, this uh, metric of uh, costs associated with textbook supplies uh, and software and hardware uh, over uh, 13, 16, 2013, 2016, and 2019, uh, showing uh, that while there's a, a good uh, decline for uh, several different reasons, there's still a sizable amount of uh, money that students in the UC system have to pay in order to be able to pursue their educational mission. Uh, this sums up to somewhere in the order of $900 uh, per uh, year, uh, which is uh, not unreasonable compared to other, uh, not different from other systems that are out there. So there's a need in order to be able to pursue OER within the UC systems as uh, there is uh, with the CSU and the uh, California Community College uh, campuses out there. Um, unfortunately, in contrast to uh, both of the other sister systems, the UC doesn't have a centralized infrastructure for pursuing OER, uh, hence why I am the informal uh, uh, representative of the, uh, the system here. Um, uh, that doesn't mean that there hasn't been a lot of OER going on uh, in the system, but it's been uh, more grassroots uh, at the campus level or at the faculty level. <clears throat> and I want to be able to highlight some of those activities out there. Um, uh, so uh, you can broadly classify them into three general categories, either bookstore-led programs, either library-led programs, uh, or faculty-led programs. And sometimes there's an admixture of the two uh, there. The primary bookstore-led program is not entirely an OER program. In fact, it gets a lot of grief within the OER community, uh, and in many circumstances, it's justifiable in order to be able to concern uh, that that issue. The um, uh, and that's uh, the, that's this uh, program that was uh, instituted on my campus at UC Davis by the bookstore called Equitable Access. Um, and I don't want to go into much of the detail behind Equitable Access. Again, it's not an OER program, but the concept behind it was uh, was intended in order to try to increase the distribution of textbooks to the students uh, in the pro uh, on campus. Uh, by uh, applying a flat fee for uh, textbooks. And right now it's at $169 per quarter, uh, such that the students uh, purchase the textbooks is folded into their tuition. And therefore uh, it's sort of forced onto the students. Again, there are lots of concerns off of here. The issue about why this is important for OER is it provides a valuable mechanism in order to distribute OER. And that's where LibreTex actually uh, has a relationship with the, the bookstore in order to get OER to the faculty uh, on my campus because they have the ability in order to select OER at the point that they are selecting the textbook. Uh, and that's a very valuable distribution mechanism for uh, pursuing OER. Uh, uh, so. Okay, um, so let's start talking about uh, uh, several of the system-wide uh, programs out there. So there are five campuses that I wanna talk about. Uh, uh, one is uh, Berkeley um, and Berkeley started this a few years ago. Um, they did a pilot in 2017, 2018, uh, referred to as the affordable course content uh, infrastructure. Um, this is a collaborative uh, effort uh, by the Center of Teaching and Learning along with associated students um, of their campus, educational technology services, library, um, all together in order to run this pilot. Uh, the, the pilot ran for several semesters, uh, supported over 40 uh, courses and saved uh, $200,000 uh, over the period alone. So the I don't have uh, 
detailed information about how much was invested into the program here, but it's a, a sizable amount less than 200,000. Uh, and no doubt as this is extended has also increased the amount of funding. So the, the theme of all the projects or many of the projects that we'll be talking about is essentially the ramp up. They, a, sig, uh, a, a low amount of money, a weak amount of money that's contributed into pursuing OER programs pays major dividends, oftentimes on the order of magnitude in order to be able to um, uh, address the infrastructure that we want to um, to address. Um, so at UC Davis, um, there was a new program that started a couple of years ago, Aggie Open. Um, I am co-chair of that program. It's a joint library, uh, sorry, library and faculty committee um, charged by our librarian, Mackenzie Smith. Uh, it capitalizes on that equitable access program that I mentioned a few slides before, whereby LibreText uh, as an off-campus entity, because it's a incorporated uh, nonprofit entity can operate as a publisher. And then instead of money going to publishers, it goes to LibreText Inc. And LibreText then redirects the funds back to campus in order to support this uh, OER program. It's a very novel idea in order to support the program when you don't have widespread support for an OER infrastructure on a campus. Uh, and the intent off of that is that, it, again, it supports uh, the, the Aggie Open infrastructure. It also provides some uh, stipends back to the faculty that adopt the book in order to facilitate uh, the curricular change that they need to do in order to uh, switch over to OER. Um, and the infrastructure here is such that the success of this approach uh, is demonstrated by the collapse of the infrastructure I just mentioned before. In other words, when students have the opportunity in order to have all the courses in their, their quarter OER, they can then opt out of this Aggie, sorry, this equitable access program. They don't pay for it and no money then goes to LibreText Inc. Uh, and then to Aggie Open, which means we've essentially achieved our goal. So our goal is essentially to not make any money uh, off of that. So. Uh, a few other uh, systems out there. UCLA uh, implemented a few years ago the Affordable Course Materials Initiative. Um, uh, again, it's a library-centered uh, effort, which most of these uh, campus-based programs are uh, set up. Uh, they invested funds in order to be able to support faculty uh, in order to uh, either build or to adopt uh, OER programs. Uh, it's received funding from their campus administration, including the executive vice chancellor, the provost, uh, and their academic senate. It supported over 125 uh, courses uh, and saved a <coughs> million dollars uh, to date. Uh, um, UC Merced several years ago implemented the Zero Cost Course Materials Grant. Um, this uh, is funded uh, and implemented by the library on their campus along with the Center for Engaged uh, Teaching and Learning. Uh, it supported OER resources development and relicensing, uh, relicensing content in the place of commercial textbooks. They allocated about uh, $30,000 for their project of, uh, several years ago. Uh, their money was set up into a hierarchical system, uh, depending upon whether they adopted uh, existing books or adapted existing books. Um, <clears throat> this table is not meant in order to be able to focus too much on other than the final number, uh, which is uh, from that uh, $30,000 investment, uh, they have saved, uh, at least as of last year, uh, close to uh, $276 thousand uh, dollars in uh, expenditures. So this ramp up is the key theme here. That's just a little bit of funding that can go a long way in terms of impact uh, or return on investment that you get here. You see Irvine uh, recently, just a few months ago, implemented uh, their faculty initiative program. It's still uh, in its initial stages. Um, and this is uh, run again by the library. Again, this single theme that comes up across here, librarians are on the front line for promoting OER uh, and uh, it's still in its initial stages out there. Uh, I wouldn't doubt that there are some uh, discussions of more OER programs on the other five campuses in the UC system, but I don't have detailed information about them right now. So those are lamp. Uh, sorry, those are grassroots at the campus level by uh, either administration uh, or the librarians in order to be able to do that. Uh, but dwarfing all those programs in terms of impact and cost is the LibreText project, which is a faculty-run project. Again, I'm biased because I'm the 
the founder of the project. Um, and the intent of that project uh, is to provide a centralized uh, technology in order to enable the building and distribution of OER textbooks, uh, to enable customization of OER textbooks. Uh, uh, and then we also have a new homework system uh, around that. Uh, there's a lot more details associated with uh, the labor text infrastructure, which I'm not going to be able to go into more uh, in time at this uh, junction, uh, but we've saved uh, millions of dollars in the state so far uh, within our infrastructure um, that's out there. Again, it's grassroots, but it's funded uh, primarily through the U.S. Department of Education uh, and the California Education Learning Lab, which is the last topic I want to bring up here. Uh, the California Education Learning Lab uh, is a uh, is funded by the Governor's Office of Planning and Research. Uh, they operate in uh, conjunction with the uh, Foundation for the California Community Colleges uh, in order to distribute funds in order to support learning outcomes, predominantly in STEM fields. Um, <coughs> But they, the point is that the content that they create, um, whether it's a technology or it's a project or curricular effort, uh, is OER or openly licensed material. Uh, so of the 39 funded projects that they uh, have, have done in the last few years, 31 of them include UCs. So it's a very valuable uh, resource in order to be able to pursue uh, OER uh, in, the, um, in the UC system. Uh, and again, their projects are primarily uh, OER sorry, primarily STEM-based uh, fields. So let me conclude with that uh, overview. There's a lot of activity going on in the UC system. I mean, given the size of the UC system, uh, significantly more development is necessary in order to be able to pursue the goals that we want to achieve, which is essentially system-wide uh, full adoption of OER across the system. I'll have a pie in the sky off the, the issue here. We wanna be able to pursue uh, activities at the system level uh, in order to be able to benefit from um, from system-wide activities, um, pursue uh, for the development at the campus level because uh, we need OER advocacy at the campus level because that's the strongest advocacy out there, especially amongst faculty um, and the, the departments that obviously the faculties are held on to in order to be able to pursue those. So with that, I will end. There are two uh, links here that you can uh, take a look at if you want to get the, some of the materials I use in order to generate this overview. I pasted it in the chat. Um, and with that, I will thank you for your attention. Thank you so much to all of you for your updates with the system. We've had quite a few questions come in uh, because for time and fairness, I'm going to try to start with one for each of you and then move into any that we have time, extra time for. So Rebecca, I'll start with you. This was one for the community colleges. Um, well, now it disappeared. Hold on. <laughs> uh, is there a mechanism to assess the accuracy of the data input into the data element? Uh, it's a complex data source that may be difficult for colleges co to collect. Yes, thank you for that question. That's a super, super, super fair uh, point. So we have, uh, yes, it's, it's complicated, it's difficult to collect. And we do at a system level have webinars coming up and uh, to really dive into what we're looking for in terms of these data elements. And I will have my colleague post the webinar uh, schedule on the chat. Um, and then also if necessary, we will put out additional guidance memos uh, kind of to, to dive, in the, uh, dive into these data elements further. Um, but also I wanna uh, really emphasize that um, data is not really like the hard truth, right? It's much more of evidence to get to kind of a temporary consensus, if you will, right? Based on all these data, this is what, how we understand where we are. And knowing that then that supports our learning and guidance in terms of the future direction. And, uh, and it's a recognition that we will be continuing to uh, collect data and learn from it. So our temporary consensus and understanding could be wrong, could be influenced by additional data in the future. So like really keep that learning mentality and think about data is really as a, as a, as a learning tool uh, to support our continued uh, evolution. Thank you. Uh, Leslie, this one's for you. It's for the CSU. Uh, it says, with the CSU May 2022 compact with the expectation of reducing course material costs by 50% by 2025, what initiatives will the ALS um, provide to enhance and increase adoption beyond current funding that's available? 
Um, that's a great question. We uh, That, um, for the rest of y'all, uh, the deadline for that or the goal is by 2025. I don't know if you said that. But um, we, we are working on a plan. We just finished our strategic planning for affordable learning solutions. And part of that was woven into it. We're increasing uh, marketing, um, uh, recognition events, um, trying to help faculty become more aware, to support faculty. As we heard yesterday when Mark McBride was speaking, what they did at SUNY, there was a lot of faculty support provided, and that was really important for the faculty to continue to use the OER after the first adoption. Finding those ancillary materials, the whole package that Mark McBride also mentioned, which is what um, uh, Del Mar is doing at LibreText with adding the homework systems. So we're trying to, um, we've got all those in our plan. Um, we don't have additional funding, so we're just hoping that we can just continue to follow the path we're doing right now, and we should be okay by 2025. And, and again, we're going to benefit from what this, the community colleges are doing with regards to their creation of OER, and then also some of their strategies, partnering. We see a lot of faculty, or a lot of our faculty teach in the community college. Um, since about 50% of our faculty are part-time or adjunct. So the, the influence that's going to be coming from the, from the community college in regards to what Rebecca shared and uh, will hopefully impact uh, it, uh, us um, directly or indirectly as well. So we will continue to collaborate with um, Michelle Pilati and uh, Del Mar through, um, through that um, I don't know what the acronym is for our little group that meets regularly. I know you're part of that too, Shelly, but, um, and I'm hoping that we can all work on that together. Great. I hope that answers well, your that question. Is, yeah, that, that, that's the Academic Senate Community College um, OERI. OERI, thank all you. My acronyms, <laughs> alphabet soon. Oh, um, Delmar, this question's for kind of, so, the question is, how are the UCs partnering with CSU and CCCs to develop OER materials? Um, <laughs> Generally. Um, you there's lots of, there's you lots of interest. What was that? Of, you did a presentation to the Board of Regents, correct? To try, I just thought maybe that might be a direction. Well, if the question is what type of uh, effort there's been in order to uh, cross link OER efforts across this, the system, there isn't one that I'm aware of within the UC system itself. N now there, like, like Leslie was mentioning, there's the, you know, we get together in order to be able to, uh, to do that process because, you know, the, the fundamental principle behind OER is sharing is caring. So uh, no matter who makes content, if it's good enough for one system, it's most likely good enough, at least for uh, some aspect on another system in order to be able to move forward. Um, but there is no active effort in order to be able to do that within the UC system. It's all outside the UC system in order to be able to pursue those things. And that folds into this greater idea that uh, uh, that's kind of being bantered around and building a center that is intersegmental in order to pursue OER for the state uh, that would then uh, be invested by the state, hopefully knock on woods in order to be able to advance that uh, activity across different uh, systems and then the interconnection between those two, which I think is exceedingly important. Great, I'm gonna throw out this question to all of you. So feel free to, all of you can answer. Uh, how does this, how do this, any of your systems increase faculty OER buy-in? and maybe ZTC buy-in as well. Well, I'll go. Um, I think it's helpful that we have boots on the ground on each one of our campuses with affordable learning solutions coordinators. Um, many of them are faculty, whether li our librarians are faculty, and then also our faculty professional development organizations are involved and, and very supportive. So, um, you know, it's it, we still have uh, academic freedom and uh, faculty still have their options to choose the materials that they use uh, to support their instruction. Um, what our goal is to show them strategies on how to potentially move to an OER, uh, be supported in that process, and then to help sustain it as well. I'll stop there. Rebecca, would you like to add? Yeah, that? I can definitely chime in. I think, you know, a big part of that is I feel like, 
you know, one hour we have our strong partner in our academic senate, right? They're curating developing quality OER resources for our faculty. And also our uh, really OER ZTC strategy is the equity strategy. And that has been at the core of our vision and our strategies and our faculty has come alongside of students and in the system and really understand what that what equity means. And I think once we really help connect all the dots, right, then I really truly believe that then it's really up to us to understand what are the structural limitations that prevent faculty who's uh, fully committed but unable to do some of the work. What are those structural limitations? And we at the system in partnership with different stakeholders and think about really removing these barriers so then faculty can, can more fully participate in the efforts. Thank you. There was a, also a general question about what are the goals for including future higher ed students, K through 12 students also in the use of OER? I'll throw that out. That's a big question. Well, I can mention, uh, at least within the context of the Libra text, we have a library dedicated to the K-12 library to the K-12 uh, scope. It's a little bit outside of my personal comfort zone, uh, but uh, we have uh, uh, efforts in order to be able to integrate existing OER and distribute it uh, in that way, the same way that we distribute it for higher education. Um, so anyone who has an interest in order to chime in uh, and contribute to that, it can certainly do so. Yeah, I found that um, through various strategies that uh, there are their selection of materials is a very different process. And uh, so it does impact the abilities to uh, adopt OER. But I think that would be a, a major focus uh, and strategy, if possible, in the future for the state to consider. Uh, but it's something that we can only provide resources for. Thank you very much. Uh, the next couple of questions were, uh, Rebecca, for the CCC. Uh, so you mentioned there would be a competitive application process for phase one, but there had been a question about, uh, did you know how many phase two grants might be awarded or approximately? Yeah, sorry about that. Actually, phase one is not a competitive oh. grant. Phase okay, so maybe is, that's explaining that. Yeah, now. so yeah, phase one is a $20,000 uh, flat grant for essentially a planning grant for every single college. Because now again, this is not just a program, it's not just an innovative program, right? It's equity, because all of our students need access to these quality textbooks, right? So, uh, so planning grant is flat to all colleges. And then the second phase is the competitive grant, right? And then again, like let me emphasize competitive grant isn't saying some colleges you're better in implementing, therefore the money goes to you and that's done. It's much more of, our goal is all colleges develop and implement their ZTC uh, strategies, right? So it's much more of a readiness assessment to understand from the chancellor's office, uh, our, you know, some colleges are ready to go. They have their plan. They've already done it last time around. They're more mature in their model and we can fund them right now, right? To really support that local innovation. But then at the same time, there are other colleges, they're not ready right now. And we are going to then, in the meantime, dedicate system level resources, right? To continue to support these colleges to get there and then provide necessary support, right, later. So I don't want colleges to get nervous and say, oh no, I'm not ready right now, I'm gonna lose this opportunity. This is the opportunity, whether or not you want it, we want to make sure the colleges actually do it and support our students. Thank you. There had also been a question about who is on the ZTC uh, advisory committee. Yes, so the task force has not uh, started yet, but uh, basically we will put that in our participatory governance uh, handbook. They will have, you know, CEO, we want perspectives, right? Rather than kind of who yet, right now it's like, we need perspectives from the academic senate. We need perspective from, right, a student. We, uh, multiple students actually, we need, right, uh, we need uh, uh, library representatives. We need OER reps. So like, so basically we will then send invitation out to these uh, stakeholder groups and asking for uh, basically inviting participation to be in that ZTC uh, task force. And again, this is a strategy task force, and then that will end after the recommendations come out. And then the next phase will be implementation because that's going to be a different type of uh, conversation, I think, right? From, from kind of strategy and iteration to implementation. 
Thank so you. multiple opportunities to participate. Thank you. That's very helpful. Uh, there was a general question um, that came out, so I want to throw it out to all of you. Uh, how do you bring in student voices to help lead your OER strategies? And, and that included surveys, advisory boards, you know, tap any. So if you could address that, that would be great. Um, I can kick us off. Our, our students have been instrumental in really shifting our thinking around program to this is really equity. This is really something that will uh, impact enrollment, persistence, and completion, right? So they are, our student senate has done a great job leading us there, right? And then in terms of uh, the task force, right, we are really having the student senate leadership in this conversation with us in the design process um, and uh, also in the uh, and then also providing their voice and what we're envisioning for the task force, the structure of it is it, we at least will have, you know, one kind of session that to be that's uh, exclusively about student voice. So it's much more kind of a fishbowl experience where we as administrators and faculty will listen to student experience and listen to, you know, their recommendations. Um, and then really then from there, uh, we will uh, kind of uh, as a group upscale, uh, upscale in terms of, uh, you know, our understanding of the landscape and then go from there, right? So really having student voice and choice in the conversation will be critical. And then in the back end, we also want to have um, our student-centered design lab, which is another infrastructure we have to collect student input. And um, so they can serve as a role to kind of validate when we have something that we think is working and we believe that we are making uh, progress towards, towards alleviating those uh, compounding fiction points, then that's have students coming in to say whether or not, right? Those are the real impacts you're feeling. Thank you, Leslie, you wanna? Yeah, um, that's great. Those are great strategies. Yeah, and for us, um, we encourage every campus on that committee for uh, well, how they distribute their funds and, and create their strategy to include students. We also go to the central student government uh, kickoff meeting every August and, and uh, work collaboratively with the students that are there. These are all the executive students folks for each campus, their presidents, their vice presidents, et cetera, and um, get the uh, request their feedback and input and support. And it's always very positive. So, um, and then we also have a basic needs initiative that's uh, active in the CSU. And so um, that's very student-centered and we continue to work on connecting into that as well. Thank you. I think we've reached our time. Michelle, is there any, any of last minute announcements or anything you wanna share? Nope, nope, thanks for asking. <laughs> Thank you to everyone on our panel for sharing system updates. I hope everyone's inspired of how collaborative our three systems are going to be in moving things open. And I hope you uh, get excited and go to lots of sessions today. We've got a panel keynote presentation discussion and lots of great breakout sessions. So please enjoy. Thank you.